Okay, let's go ahead and get started. About five minutes past the start of class. So I'm going to start by uh, reviewing Section 5B and so 5B, we're talking about properties of solutions and formalism is um, essentially what we develop for uh, the mixtures of gases in the sense that we're talking about um, how to calculate the uh, free energy of mixing of uh, solutions and liquid mixtures. And so um, we, this is a relatively straight Times that times a uh, mole fraction of a times the quantity of mole fraction of a plus mole fraction of b times the quantity of mole fraction of b. So that's one simple result. And then uh, using our definition of the uh, Gibbs energy to calculate the change in the entropy of mixing, the entropy of mixing uh, of two uh, two components in a liquid mixture. And we, we, we briefly introduced the idea of excess function. <coughs> some time discussing colligative properties and so we we, um, we reviewed what the, we uh, learned what the assumptions are for interpreting colligative properties or explaining colligative properties uh, being that uh, the solute that we add to the solution is not um, not volatile so it doesn't appear in the vapor phase so it doesn't affect the chemical potential of the vapor phase and it uh, it's insoluble with the or immiscible with the solid phase, um, so we expect that if um, if we add a solute to a liquid uh, to a solvent and we freeze it, that the uh, solute will separate and not be a part of the frozen solid phase of the solvent. And so the only effect is on the liquid phase, and then we. Um, as a function of temperature again, we have to go back to the fundamental <coughs> equation, uh, this energy would be equal to the BDT minus SDT, and we're uh, looking at changing the temperature at constant pressure, then we Central and liquid phase, and now the liquid 
the intersection point, uh, which designates the marker for the retrieval point, because we have a sheet disk with the lowest point of the spectrum earlier in the cache. Uh, for instance, the lowest point elevation is the same as what the cache has. We talked about, uh, in terms of pre-edge and why, why we would want to change the what the cache has back up in the uh, in the autonomous system and the interface that we use to get the cache up. But we need to uh, reach, to, uh, reach the intersection point such that if the system estimates um, even a higher point of potential and we're able to achieve that, to increase the point of potential, we need to um, reduce the point of the negative, Negative change in temperature, uh, and negative slope to increase the pH. And so you can see that we can have a reduction uh, of the potential or an increase in temperature over time as the supply uh, comes to the point that we're reaching the intersection point. So, uh, and then the same earlier point elevation, the same point we have our new free energy curve to catch the temperature. Intersection point, we have to uh, do a final display where we get a lower point of potential display. And so, we're going to, if we increase the temperature, the, the free energy uh, will decrease and then we'll assign a point of energy. And so, as we increase the temperature, we will get an increase in the point of energy temperature. And so, uh, let's see, we have our assumptions. So now we're on the section 5.C, or uh, section 5C. And so now we get into vapor pressure calculus. So that's just what we went over for your, or your last quiz was the, um, spend a fair amount of time uh, getting used to looking at veins of vapor pressure diagrams. Uh, sort of looking at pressure as a function of the uh, composition. So we have pressure versus composition diagrams. And since we were going to print so much attention to that, we learned how to how to derive an interesting expression for pressure in terms of composition in terms of general factor A and G is the product of composition. So by uh, following the uh, how we express the low fraction vapor veins in terms of the composition of the vapor veins, which has to be determined by the uh, low fraction degree. System in terms of low fraction or the composition of vapor veins. So we went through that so we would understand how we uh, how we are able to derive these vapor pressure diagrams. And so when we did that, we would plot this like this on the same. Pressure, uh, in terms of the Schist corporation, that's 
So just in terms of accomplishing this diagram, is there anything that we choose some more fraction that's then equal to, let's say, 0.7? And so we know that when the system is a full question, if, if we compare a solution, if we compare a solution Change the pressure on this liquid, we increase the pressure on the system, and we move away from those conditions of an equilibrium that is uh, equal to zero point seven. We start to reduce the pressure on the system. Well, this region between the two lines is the region that has equal equals, which is the peak of the two, the two phases uh, in equilibrium, and so. As we, as we reach this point, essentially we're getting uh, a, a melting technique and we're reducing the pressure just slightly. And so we have a rate on which is going to have this composition of the full fraction. And we get a rate that is going to be this fraction of the system. And so you know, as we gradually decrease the pressure on the system, Essentially, going to be um, a very tiny amount of liquid in an equilibrium of vapor. If we reduce the vapor further, the vapor pressure further, we're going to be in a single phase, equal to the vapor phase. And so, it's important to be able to work with these vapor pressure diagrams and to understand where the lines come from. to uh, the liquid liquid phase diagrams as we go. So for the liquid liquid phase diagrams, as an example, we look at temperature versus quantity. Let's say that you have this quantity in the middle, which is E1. You're at a temperature which is below the critical temperature, and so you have two phases, and they're both liquid phases, but they're going to have different compositions. Let's say that this is um, a compound of alpha and this is a compound of beta on this side. Then This is the, the 
composition of one phase, this phase, would be no fraction of u equals 0.8 and no fraction of k equals 0.2 of sigma. For this other phase, let's say this is uh, 0.5 and 0 0.6, 0 0.3, the composition of this phase would be no fraction of u equals Composition of the liquid that I add. If I reduce the temperature, then it's going to separate into two phases. And now the composition of the two phases will be determined by taking the mass of um, this phase I have used in the pi line to extract my negative two degree equilibrium temperature and drop it down to the appropriate amount, no fraction of. And the other kind of final thing is kind of how much of this phase is left. And that's going to be the number of moles. So we have the number of moles of that phase alpha phase relative to the number of the amount of alpha phase relative to the amount of beta phase is going to be determined by the entitlement. I can't tell what the value of that is. So maybe we can just leave it at that. So the distance is going to be whatever this value is, 0.8 minus 0.6, would be the difference in the mole fraction between the number of moles of this one and the other. And the distance from here is going to be this uh, mole fraction of u minus the mole fraction of uh, u to the amount of phase. And this one would be the distance from here. Does that make sense? So you can easily be asked the question, are your um, solutions prepared to determine the mole fraction of, of, of whatever the component is, let's say that x angle minus y angle is the alpha stage, um, and if you don't have any questions about trivial temperature and charges, what the mole fraction is of the structure, then you can do that, you don't have to ask to determine what the, mole, what the composition of the two Positions are and what the relative amounts of each phase is. So you don't have to really get separated so much from the number of moles. So we did talk about liquid solid, we did say it's not compressible, and we did go over the term elasticity, so that's a rough plot of it. I want to make sure I spend enough time on Bobby and Bobby up to talk about this. I want to switch the roles. Remember in 5e we're talking about activities. 
And so we talk about solvent activities. is redefining standard terms. And specifically talking about the biological difference between the standard terms. So activities, remember we introduce activities as uh, low fraction or effective concentration uh, to account for deviation from ideal behavior uh, in real time. So so we talked about solving that. So what we're doing is we're, we're accounting for the change in the chemical potential of the solvent in the case that um, the mole fraction, in, in the case where it's not pure solvent. So we have the chemical potential A um, reduces to the constituent chemical potential of pure solvent in the case where essentially the mole fraction in this case, we're substituting the activity for the mole fraction. So if we add solute or another substance to the solvent, we'll have a reduced chemical potential of the solvent. Um, if, if the solvent behaves as an ideal solvent, then it's going to be reduced simply by its uh, mole fraction. But if it behaves Ideally, then we're going to use its activity or essentially its effective mole fraction in a solution to account for deviation from ideal behavior. So the activity that I now define as its partial pressure is about uh, partial pressure of pure salt. Or the different situations we've talked about here. How do you calculate the activity of the solvent? How do you calculate the activity of the solute? And then how do you calculate the activity in the case of the biological system? Or continuing that in the, in the next section, how do you calculate the activity of ions in solution? is the um, activity coefficient. And so we have that the activity approaches the mole fraction as the activity coefficient approaches the mole fraction. And so we have this proportionality. And so we write the activity A is equal to Writing the activity in terms of uh, its proportionality to the 
So, when we're talking about hydrogen ions, uh, the activity of trans ions in solution, then we have the chemical potential of hydrogen ions is equal to the chemical potential of the standard state. Yeah. 
So we're essentially going to solve this reactivity and substitute it back into this expression. Okay. So when you solve this for A, you have that the activity of hydrogen is equal to minus V naught. And this is log H. So it's log. So this is a general formula that is not expected for pH being different from zero. So uh, it's not even for the potential of hydrogen in this case. Um, equal to the standard for the potential of hydrogen ions um, <coughs> minus RT minus the logarithm of 10 times pH. So it's a pretty trivial to define the um, difference. In free energy for a reaction between the biological <coughs> reference state and free energy reaction for the standard state. So we can we can calculate for the reaction A plus 2H plus Example in the book. So the way we um, set this up, we want to calculate the free energy of the um, for the biological standard state. It's going to be equal to chemical potential for the product for the biological standard <coughs> state minus the sum. Of A in its biological standard state minus two times chemical potential in the biological standard state of the hydrogen atom. Okay. Now, Dr. Wilson will explain this. For, for reactions and products that don't involve energy ions, the, the um, chemical potential is independent of the reference. Switch to a new reference state. So it's going to be minus two times the um, standard chemical potential of energy ions uh, minus. So this, I'm sorry, this is minus minus the potential of the reference state. Group the 
term together, but we're in the standard working space, so now there is critical potential of B, minus standard chemical potential of A. Standard reaction chemical potential in the standard state plus 14 of C minus R equals 10, which is equal to this reaction, the reaction in our model. So I calculate this. The reaction gives energy. going to go through the, the um, example problem that goes along with that in a moment. But this is self-test. Five equals point four. And again, we're asked to find that relationship between free energy reaction and our Minus 41 RC minus 110, which is equal to 
minus one minus two point eight kilograms per minute. So go ahead and make sure you're comfortable um, in uh, calculating the, the difference in the free energy reactions um, between the standard states and the uh, biological standard states. Question then becomes how do you calculate the uh, activity coefficients of those two moving reactions? Thank 
then we have plus RT, which is our other activity coefficient for the anion plus RT, that's our other uh, the activity coefficient for the anion. And so we have a product, we have a sum of two logarithm terms, which we can, we can rewrite as a product. Coefficient for the anion times the activity coefficient of the anion. That's important because um, if you're unable to attribute deviation from ideal behavior just to cations separately from anions, so the way we treat it is that we're, we're going to introduce something called a, uh, a mean activity coefficient. A mean activity coefficient, which is uh, calculated as. bringing the deviation from ideal behavior into a single term which results in a product that allows us to define an average or mean activity coefficient. And we use that to define the activity of any given uh, uh, type of ion. So if we wanted to, again, describe the chemical potential of the cation distribution, it's k equal to the chemical potential for the ideal ion distribution plus RT, and that's our logarithm. Activity coefficient, but it's the mean activity coefficient because we can't we can't uh, determine the deviation from ideal behavior based on how volatile or volatile the solution is. We use the mean activity coefficient. Um, we can generalize that to the case where we have an ionic solid of n sub t and n sub q, then the molar field energy. Coefficient for the cation for each of these two cations in the ionic solid form. The activity coefficient of the anion for each of these two anion conjugations. And now we're dividing one over s instead of one over two, where s is equal to the sum of the um, number of the stoichiometric number of the cations in that solution. So if we were given something like uh, you know, magnesium chloride. Calcium chloride, we would do something like that. You would have to subtract the stoichiometry of the ion in the solution from the result of the chemical potential. So, the last thing I'm going to go over is the underlying homolytic laws. Um, so, in other words, from uh, ideal behavior. And so um, the divide up the little theory law, we have the log of this mean activity coefficient for the anion minus A times absolute value of the product of the uh, magnitude of charges times the square root of the ionic Allowing is just uh, 
not able to run more per quarter. So if you're getting an allowance of maybe five hundred dollars a month for that short term quarter, if the goal is to keep you as your goal is quarter, then um, you don't really have to worry about that. It's a much better way to keep strong than being able to quit at any time. And you can still do your best to keep your goal as quarter. But just again you can choose why. You know, if you need Gives you the water to do the activity coefficient, and then you can work on that and work on the coefficient modification. Okay. Any final examples here for quarter two? So, the brief illustration for your book is to calculate the need activity coefficient for. Over the current time 
Thank you. 